It's good to be with you, church. My name is Halim Sa. I serve as one of the pastors and elders here at the Stone. <clears throat> we're in the second week of our series on the Ten Commandments today, and we're going to be looking at the second commandment. But before we get there, let's do a quick recap on the first commandment, because the first commandment and the second commandment, they go so hand in hand together. The first commandment said, you shall have no other gods before me. It said, you shall have no other gods before me. The first commandment is addressing that which is first and foremost about us. That which is first and foremost about us. And what is that? It's saying that God is our creator. And when he created us, he created us to be first and foremost worshipers that worship him and him alone. And because of that, no matter how hard we try to go after other gods, other idols, other things in this world to find our happiness, to find our joy, it will not make us satisfied. It will not bring that joy that we are looking for. False gods will always disappoint because the Bible says when he created us, he placed eternity in our hearts. He placed eternity in our hearts. And because of that, he is the only one that can calm our fluttering hearts and make it forever content, forever satisfied, and forever happy. Other things in this world might make us happy for a little bit, might make us content for a little bit, right? But eventually we get over it. God, the eternal one, he's the only one that can forever make us happy and satisfied because he's the one who placed that eternity in our hearts, our one and only true God. And today we're going to be looking at the second commandment. And similar to the way that we looked at the first commandment last week, we're going to be looking at it by asking three questions. Number one, what is the command? What is the commandment? What's God really commanding? What's he really saying? What's he really wanting from us? And number two, what are the ways that we disobey this commandment? What are the ways that we disobey this commandment and what does God do when we disobey? And number three, what happens when we obey? Why is obedience so crucial? Why is obedience so urgent and why is it so important? And so three ways, what is the commandment what are the ways that we disobey, and what happens when we obey? Let's look at the second commandment. Let's read it from the beginning in Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. That was the first one. Here's the second one, verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." The first commandment said, you shall worship no other gods. Now the second commandment is saying, you shouldn't worship any graven image, carved images that you have made for yourselves. And it sounds so similar, doesn't it? The first commandment says, don't worship false gods. And second commandment says, don't worship carved images. They sound so similar. For the longest time, I wondered why these were two separate commandments. They look the same to me. But it's not the same. Let me show you. The first commandment is saying, don't worship false gods, only worship the true God, right? But the second commandment is saying, and don't worship the true God in a false way, okay? The first commandment is saying, don't worship false gods, only the true God. The second commandment is saying, and don't worship the true God in a false way. And so what are the ways that we worship the true God in a false way? Well, he says, by making a carved image out of him, by making a physical representation of him. And as God was giving his people, as God was giving Moses the Ten Commandments on top of Mount Sinai, his people were at the foot of the mountain in that very moment, breaking this very commandment. What were they doing? God's people were wondering where Moses was. He was taking too long on top of the mountain. And so they go to Aaron, Moses' brother, and they say, we want you to lead us. 
We want you to lead us, and we want you to lead us in worship. We want to worship God for delivering us out of Egypt, okay? And so this is what Aaron does. He takes all their gold rings, he takes all their gold earrings, and he forms and fashions a golden calf, an image of a golden bull, and he says, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. And it says that the people ate and drank and worshiped and celebrated. Now, before we immediately come down on the Israelites here and think, how in the world could they do this? The Israelites, we have to understand that they've been in Egypt for 400 years, which means that Egypt was all they knew. It was all they knew. This was the only way they knew how to worship, to bow down to a statue, to worship some image of a created thing. The Israelites in this moment weren't trying to worship false gods. The Israelites in this moment weren't trying to worship some god that they learned of in Egypt. The Israelites in this moment were trying to worship the true god, but in a false way. The Israelites worshiping the golden calf was not a breaking of the first commandment. They were trying to worship the true god, but it was a breaking of the second commandment. They were trying to worship the true god, but in a false way. And God sees what's happening here, and Exodus 32 tells us that God burned with anger, and he has to hold back his wrath from consuming them. He almost wipes out a people that he has just saved. And so what do we learn from that? We learn that the second commandment is a huge deal. It's a huge deal, right? We might think, what's the big deal? At least they had good intentions. What's the big deal? At least they were trying, right? But in God's eyes, who you worship, how you worship, is just as critical, okay? And the second commandment is a huge deal. Why is it such a big deal? God tells us why it's such a big deal within the commandment in verse 5. Verse 4 says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. And then verse 5 says, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. That's the reason he gives. The reason specifically given for God commanding us not to make an image of him is because he says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, that doesn't sound good to human ears, does it? Typically, when we hear jealous, we hear it in the most negative sense, right? Typically, when we say jealous, we mean desiring something that doesn't belong to you, wanting something, craving something that doesn't belong to you. But can jealousy in that context ever be applied to God? Wanting something that doesn't belong to you. No, because everything belongs to God, right? Everything belongs to God. We as his people especially belong to him. And so jealousy, when it's directed at something that actually does belong to you, can be a good thing. God is displaying a holy jealousy here that's rooted and love, a holy jealousy is an intense, caring devotion for the object of your love. It's like a mother's jealous protection for her children. It's like a father's jealous guarding of his home. A God who is not jealous would be as contemptible as a husband who doesn't care whether his wife is committing adultery or not. A God who is not jealous would be as contemptible as a mother who just lets her children run out into oncoming traffic. Our, out of jealousy, we protect. Out of jealousy, we guard the ones that we love. So the question is, what is God protecting us from? What is God guarding us from when he commands us that we not make an image of him? He's protecting us from missing out on him. He's guarding us from not getting all of him, okay? Let me explain. You might look at a golden bull, and if you thought that was the representation of your God, you might come to the conclusion, wow, my God must be really strong. My God must be really powerful, right? You can see how someone could come to that conclusion. But the conclusion you'll never come to by looking at a golden calf is to think, wow, my God must really care for me. My God must really love me. You won't come to that conclusion. By, by looking at a golden calf, you won't come to the conclusion, wow, my God must have created the heavens and the earth. Why? Because you're looking at a created thing. In fact, an image that we create to represent God will always conceal more about God than it will actually reveal. It will always hide more than it can display. 
through an image, we might dis be displaying some aspect of God, right? Like his power. But that image, all that it can display is that one image. And not even very well, in fact, right? How much is God's power compared to the power of a golden bull? And on top of that, it'll hide all the other attributes of God. An image that we make of God, no matter what that image is, the commandment is saying, whether it's some, something you got from heaven, something you got from earth, something you got from under the water, it will always hide more of God than it will display. And God is jealous for us to know all of him. But now, how many of us this week carved an image, painted a picture, and said, this is my God, this is the God of the Bible, I'm going to bow down and worship it? How many of us did that this week? Nobody? Well, good. I'm glad. But just as we found out last week that worshiping other gods wasn't just about, wasn't just about the physical external act of bowing down to some statue made out of wood and stone, but it was really addressing the idols of the heart, right? The second commandment, too, is about our hearts. We have to understand that God is always after our hearts. And so we may not be making a physical, external, carved image of God, but what this commandment is really addressing is our proneness to make an image of God in our minds. To make an image of God in our minds and in our hearts. At the heart of it, what the second commandment is saying is that you mustn't worship the true God as you imagine him to be. And you mustn't worship the true God as you prefer him to be. But you must worship the true God as he reveals himself to be. You see, while the first commandment is revealing the proneness of the human heart to worship other gods, false gods, right? The second commandment is addressing the proneness of the human heart to, address, to worship the true God, but as we imagine him to be in our minds, as we prefer him to be in our hearts, not as he revealed himself to be in his word. In the second commandment, God is saying, don't just worship the aspects of me that you really like and really value. He's saying, worship me as I reveal myself to be in my word, as I really am, the fullness of who I am, all of my attributes. Kevin Peck, our lead pastor, he uses this illustration sometimes, and I think it's so good. I think it's so powerful in helping us feel the weight of what God is valuing here in the second commandment. Let's say an engaged couple is out to dinner, nice candlelit dinner, and the guy is looking at his fiance, and she's looking gorgeous, and the meal is just perfect, and he's just thinking, man, I love this woman. Right? I love everything about her. I like her just the way she is, and I can't wait to marry her. And the girl is looking at the guy, and she's thinking, wow, I, I love this man. I can't wait to marry him, right? I feel safe with him. I, I trust him. I want to sh share everything with him. I want him to know who I am. I don't want to hide anything. And so she looks at her fiance kind of nervously and, and she says, I love you and I can't wait to marry you. Um, but before we do, I just want to share all of who I am with you. You know, there's some things that you may not know about me. There's some things that I've never told anyone, but I want to share those things with you. Can I? And what if in that moment, the guy's looking intently at his fiance, thinking through what she has just said, and what if he responds, um, no thank you, can you just pass the potatoes? <laughs> what if his response is, you know, actually no thank you because the image that I have of you right now is so perfect, I really like that image, I don't want you to say anything or share anything with me that might disturb that image. What if he says, you know, the way I like you exactly the way that you are in my mind right now. Now, should this girl marry this dummy? <laughs> if you were doing premarital counseling and she asked you, my, my fiance just said this, should I marry him? What would you say? Don't marry him. Don't marry him. Why? Why not? Because he wasn't really pursuing her. He didn't really want to marry her. He wanted to marry some fictitious idea of a girl that he had invented in his mind, right? And what God is saying in the second commandment is, this is who I am. All of me. It's in here. This is the fullness of who I am. And now when you read through this, there's going to be some things that you love. There's going to be some things that you really like, but there's going to be some things you don't understand. 
There's going to be some things that, that you really don't even like, right? But nevertheless, this is who I am, all of me, all of me. And if we say, if our response back to God is, God, but, but that's all that stuff in the Bible is just too difficult to understand. It's just for theologians, God. God, let me, just, let me just worship you the way that I've been worshiping you. Let me just think of you the way that I've been thinking of you, right? I just have a simple faith, God. I just have a childlike faith. It might sound humble, but it's the most selfish, prideful thing you could ever say to God. It's the equivalent of telling God, after all that he's done to reveal himself to you, it's the equivalent of you looking at him saying, no thanks, God, pass the potatoes. The second commandment, very simply put, is God looking at us and saying, I want you to have all of me. And if you reject any part of me, then you're rejecting me entirely. You can't pick and choose what you like about God, what you want of God, and leave others. God is not a buffet line. He's a person. He's a person. You can take him, you can leave him, but you can't pick and choose things about him that you like. You must not imagine him to be whatever you want him to be. That's what the second commandment is saying. You must not say, I like to think of God as dot, dot, dot. How many of us ever said that? How many of us have ever heard that? I'd like to think of God as dot, dot, dot. Jaya Pecker, the great British theologian, says the second commandment means that any statement that begins, I'd like to think of God as, should never be trusted. It should never be trusted. And so moving into the next question, what are the ways that we disobey this commandment? What are the ways that we say, I like to think of God as dot, dot, dot? Or the flip side of that statement, I can't believe in a God who would dot, 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 right? Whether we say, I like to think of God as, or whether we say, I can't believe in a God who would, what are we doing? We're trying to determine what God should be like. They're trying to set boundaries for what he can or cannot do. We're trying to edit him, Photoshop him into a nice little neat God that can fit into our family photo album, a God that won't embarrass us in front of the neighbors, right? A God that won't cross us or contradict us out in public, a God that's safe and fun for the whole family, right? That's what we're trying to do. So what are the ways that we edit God? When we say things like, I'd like to think of God as just a God of love, all right? I'd like to think of God as just a God of love. We're trying to edit out his righteousness. When we say things like, you know, I can't believe in a God who would send people to hell, what are we doing? We're trying to edit out his justice. When we say things like, you know, I believe that God, he doesn't cause calamities to happen in this world, Right? But when they happen, he can turn them for good. Right? He has nothing to do with earthquakes or tsunamis or world hunger or anything like that happening in this world. Those are bad and terrible things. But when they happen, I believe he turns it for good. What are we saying? What are, we, what are we saying? What are we doing? Well, we're trying to maintain his goodness, right? We're saying, well, God that I know is good, and these things are bad, and therefore if he's good, then he wouldn't do that. God had nothing to do with that, we tell the world. But we're trying to preserve and protect God's goodness. Well, first of all, God does not need to be protected. Second of all, we're trying to preserve God's goodness, but at the cost of what? At the cost of surrendering his sovereignty at the cost of sur surrendering the fact that he's in control over all things and there's not a single rogue molecule in the universe. Many times when we create an image of God for ourselves, it's not that we're trying to get rid of God altogether. In fact, it's the opposite. We're desperately trying to cling on to him, but not the fullness of, he, of who he actually is. We're trying to cling on to his attributes that we really like his attributes that we're really comfortable with, like his love, his mercy, his goodness, the attributes that we really like, the attributes that we don't feel nervous telling people about. But in doing so, we throw out of the window the attributes of his righteousness, his justice, his sovereignty. We try to remove all of God's hard edges and try to make him as palatable and soft and snugly and warm as possible. 
And so we're commanded not to make our own images of God because many times it's our attempt at having a God that is safe, a God that we can control, a God that we can predict. But Pastor Tim Keller, pastor that we love here at the Stone, we're so influenced by, he says something very interesting. He states another motivation that we have in wanting an image of God, another motivation. He says, if we're, if we're allowed to make our own images of God, we cannot avoid controlling him. But if we have no images of God, then we just have this invisible abstraction and we can't know him personally. In other words, if you're allowed to make your own images any old way, you'll control God. But if you don't have any images at all, you can't have a personal relationship. It will just be an abstraction. What Pastor Tim Keller is saying is that, of course, there are negative motivations for why we want to create an image of God for ourselves, but wanting an image in and of itself is not bad, okay? Wanting an image in and of itself is not bad. It's a desire that we have deep in our souls, right, to not just have a God who would speak invisibly from on top of a mountain. It's a deep longing of the soul to want a God who would not just be invisible and far off, but to have a God that is near, to have a God that is with us, to have a God that knows what it's like to be in the flesh, to have a God who knows what it's like to go through suffering and pain in this world so that when you're hurting, he could come and hold you and embrace you and tell you, I know what you're going through, right? It's a deep longing of the human soul to have a God like that. And does any of that sound familiar? Colossians 1.15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. There it is. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Who's that talking about? Colossians 2.9 says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Something we can see, something we can touch. Who's that talking about? Hebrews 1.3 says, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Exact imprint, exact representation, there it is. Who is that talking about? What is all of this showing us? This is showing us that Jesus is the fulfillment of the second commandment. Jesus is the fulfillment of the second commandment. The commandment says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. What God is saying is, don't make for yourself an image. That's the command. Not that we don't need an image. Don't make for yourself an image. Why? Because we'll always get it wrong. But God knows that we need an image. What God is saying in Colossians 1 is, here is Jesus, my son. Here's the image that you need. Here's the perfect image that you need. Colossians 2 tells us, in him, the fullness of deity dwells bodily. The person of Jesus is the only image that perfectly shows the fullness of who he is, not just the attributes of God, of God that we like, okay? But the, all of his attributes. And Hebrews 1 tells us that he is the exact imprint of God's nature. Jesus is the only one that shows God to us without any distortion, without any partiality. The incarnation of Jesus is the fulfillment of the second commandment. But even with the person of Jesus, the fullest revelation of God to us, even though God has given us the right image, the perfect image, you know what we do with that image? We try to edit that image as well. We try to make a Jesus of our own making. We try to create for ourselves a kind of a Prozac Jesus, a Jesus that makes you feel better, kind of a therapeutic Jesus because life is hard and you just need Jesus well, that'll come alongside of you and tell you it's okay, it's gonna be okay, I'm in control, I love you, right? This is the one I'm personally guilty of. Sometimes bad things happen in this world like the Syrian refugee crisis or, or in your personal life like my dad being diagnosed with cancer, and immediately what I tell myself is, it's okay, it's gonna be okay, God's in control, God's in control, right? And some people look at that and they think, wow, that's really great faith. But if I were honest, many times it's not faith at all. It's just apathy. It's apathy. It's because I don't want to look at what's happened in this world, tragedy strikes and I don't want to feel it. I don't want to care. I don't want to mourn with those who mourn. I just want to keep enjoying my dinner. I just want to keep watching my TV show. 
And so I take a dose of my Prozac Jesus so I can numb out the pain so I don't have to feel that bad things happen in this world and people are in pain. But the true Jesus, true Jesus, is he in control? Absolutely. But he was willing to feel. He was willing to experience pain and weep. And he calls us to do the, to the, to do the same. God being in control should not give us an excuse to pull away from the world. God being in control should enable us to engage the world, all of it, even the most horrific things. Or we create kind of an Amazon.com Jesus, an on-demand place where you can get what you want in your life, Right? But if you go to Jesus and he doesn't have what you're looking for, he doesn't give you what you want, no big deal because you'll just run over to Target or Home Depot. But the true Jesus, true Jesus will always give you what you need, even if it's at the cost of not giving you what you want. That's what the true Jesus does. You may have all these wants, right? But the true Jesus will always give you what you need, even if it's at the cost of not giving you what you want. We're so selective in our embrace of Jesus. We, we love the singing, but we reject the suffering. We love the quote-unquote blessings he gives us, but we deny the dying and the denying of ourselves. Or we create kind of a district attorney, Jesus, your own very personal attorney that's going to go after all those people that's wronged you. But the true Jesus, he's not going to just point out the wrongs in their life and go after them. He's going to point out the wrongs in your life and go after you. And the true Jesus, he's not just offering you forgiveness, he's offering forgiveness to your worst enemy, to the people that have wronged you most in this life. Or we create kind of a retirement planner, Jesus. You'll pay towards your retirement, you'll faithfully tithe, you'll read your Bible, you'll go to church, you're willing to do anything and everything just as long as what? As long as he'll pay out in the end. As long as he'll accept you in the end because why? You've earned it, right? But the true Jesus says, I've already set my love upon you. I've already bound myself up with you. You can't earn my love. I'm giving it to you freely by grace. How heartbroken would you be if you found out that your children obeyed you and did their chores because they thought if they didn't, you would stop loving them? How heartbroken would you be? Are you worshiping a Jesus of your own making or are you worshiping the true Jesus of the Bible? W.H. Auden, the great English poet of the 1930s, he went back to Christianity after being an atheist. And when his friends asked, why are you going back? This is what he said. He said, I believe in Jesus because he fulfills none of my dreams, because he's in every respect the opposite of what he would be if I could have made him in my own image. I believe in Jesus because he fulfills none of my dreams. Do you believe in Jesus because he fulfills all of your dreams? That's a good litmus test. It's a good litmus test. What he's saying here is that if you truly look at the Jesus of the Bible, you realize that he's real, absolutely real. How do you know that? Because you realize that no one would have made up a savior like this. He's saying, go read the things that he's taught, okay? And what you're going to see is that he always goes against our desires. If you go look at what Jesus did, he keeps defying our expectations. We expect Jesus to be one way, but he's another way. If you go and look at Jesus and you find him there in the scriptures, you'll see that he's been what you've been after all your life. But on the other hand, he's been the one you've been running from all your life. He's real. The real Jesus who you don't want to believe in because it means losing control, but you have to because you can't deny him anymore. anymore. He's a real person that keeps coming after you. Only the real Jesus can change you and change your trajectory. Only the real Jesus can ultimately fulfill you. Only the real Jesus can save you. And the real Jesus is the only hope that we have in saving us from the Jesus of our own making. Does the Jesus that you worship, does he ever contradict you? If the Jesus that you worship never contradicts you, if he just lets you keep living the way that you want, he never speaks into your life and says, stop doing this, change this, that's how you know you have a Jesus of your own making. The real Jesus will make you real uncomfortable, okay? Are you real comfortable with the Jesus that you're worshiping? That's how you know you have a Jesus of your own making. Jesus is a real person. He's coming after you. 
I want to close by very quickly looking at the last part of the commandment and asking what difference does our obedience make? Why does it matter so much that we obey? Verse 4, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. Okay. Why? Because he's a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. What's he saying here? What difference does it make? What he's saying here is that there's a legacy that you're leaving with your worship, with the way that you're worshiping. You're showing people who God is by the way that you worship. You're either pointing people to the real God as he truly is, all of his attributes, as he reveals himself in the scriptures, the fullness of who he's displayed himself to be in the person of Jesus, or you're pointing people to a fake God, just some God that you've imagined in your mind, some invented being. Church, our worship matters, it eternally matters because by it we're either showing the world the true God that can save, why? Because he's real. Or a God that can't save, why? Because he's fake. He's simply the product of our imagination. The Bible tells us that there's salvation in no one else but the person of Jesus. That there is no other name that is given among men by which we must be saved but the name of Jesus. With our worship, this text is saying, we're either pointing the world to the Jesus that the Bible's talking about, right? That Jesus that can actually save, or we're pointing people to a Jesus of our own making. In God's sovereignty, in God's sovereignty, he's determined that by our worship, we're either leaving a legacy of destruction or a legacy of salvation. What this is saying is this, Parents, parents, make no mistake, it matters to your children how you worship. It matters to your children how you worship. College students, it matters to your university, it matters to your roommates how you worship. Church, what this is saying is it matters for your neighbors, it matters for your family members, it matters for your coworkers how you worship. It eternally matters. It eternally matters. You're leaving a legacy. And so let's be a people, let's be a church that worships God, but not as we imagine him to be in our minds, not as we prefer him to be in our hearts, but as he has revealed himself to be in his word, as he has fully displayed himself to be in the person of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, First and foremost, we want to thank you that you are real. You're real, Lord. And, and one of the reasons why we can be so sure today that you are real is because I personally know that if it were up to me, I would have left you a long time ago. I would have stopped following you a long time ago. Because in so many ways, you have displayed yourself to be a God that we don't want. You've displayed yourself to be a God that keeps contradicting us, that keeps defying our expectations. A God that we would never make up or create for ourselves because you give us none of our dreams. And yet at the same time, we can't do anything but believe in you. We can't do anything but trust in you because even though so many times you are not a God that we want, we are convinced of this, that you are a God that we need. You are a God that we desperately need. You are a God that does not leave us in all of our inventive ways to run away from you. You keep pursuing us. You keep pursuing us and coming after us to make us your own. And so, Father, my prayer is this. My prayer is that you would be jealous over us as a mother is jealous for her children, as a father, jealousy guards his home. Father, will you be jealous over our church? 
Will you be jealous over the people sitting in this room? Will you be jealous over me and my family? Father, will you be jealous to not let us go after things, go after a version of you that we have invented for ourselves in our hearts and in our minds? Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you did not remain a God who was far off, but you came near. And you gave us the image, the perfect image that we so desperately needed. Father, we pray that all our days we would see you and him, and that we would be satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.